Hi everyone, I think I've got a very interesting video for you today. I've been wanting to do this video for the last couple of weeks and I was able to work it in the rotation. I appreciate those of you who alerted me to this news story. What we're talking about is the formation of a sinkhole underneath the roadway on Interstate 80 in New Jersey, a little bit east of exit 34. This happened on December 26th, so the day after Christmas. Fortunately, traffic was much lighter. Nobody drove into the sinkhole, there were no injuries, but it could have been a far different situation. So I wanna go over the specifics of this sinkhole, what caused it to form, other uh, concerns that I have for this immediate location, as well as others that may have similar geologic or underlying conditions. So we're talking about this area here. This is a Google Earth image. I've circled the area where the sinkhole formed. Now there's a couple of good news stories out of New York. I've got links in the description to all of these news sources, as well as my other references cited here in this video. So let's just play this for a second. A massive sinkhole on the very busy I-80 is causing delays in New Jersey. You can see right behind me in the distance some flashing lights. That's where crews are working on that sinkhole. We are standing by an exit where traffic is being detoured to. Thankfully, no injuries have been reported. So this sinkhole is about 40 foot diameter. It looks to be about 15 foot deep. You can see the guardrail just suspended over the opening. And according to reports, the sinkhole extended underneath two of the lanes on the roadway, as well as the shoulder. And you can see it's in rather close proximity to an apartment building. I think it's about 300 feet away. So let's look at some of these other images. You can see the profile here, where the roadway is definitely undermined well into the road section. So looks like uh, some fill material. Could be some natural clay, but I suspect it's fill since that was a roadway section. New Jersey DOT backfilled this area and got the roadway fully reopened within a couple of days. So they were back in action on that Monday. So I looked at sources of information for locations of other mines throughout this area. And you can see all the black dots and they form a linear feature, which is common when you're following geologic deposits along a vein, uh, whether it's from intrusion or from prevailing joint patterns that uh, minerals later form in, but that's a uh, extensive number of mines. This is the area that we're talking about. The particular mines, 238, 239, 241. These are the Meadow Mine, the Mount Pleasant Mine, Johnson Hill Mine, and so on. So these are former iron mines. So apparently there's been mining activity in New Jersey for iron between the 1600s and the 1800s. So these are, are quite old mines. And I suspect they don't have a handle on all the little mine locations as well as their lateral extent underground. Later on, there was a subsequent phase of zinc ore mining. And there's actually a museum there. And uh, part of the tour, they show you this area where they apply ultraviolet lights and the zinc minerals actually fluoresce, which is really cool. Now I went to this uh, site, New Jersey, has a really good geographic information system online. So I brought up the layer for delineation of these mines and you can see all these red dots. And in fact, you can see a dot within feet of where this sinkhole developed. And there's many other mines nearby. In fact, at the intersection of 634 and I-80, there's a indication of a mine right at that intersection. So this is what we're talking about for the iron ore. In this case, it was magnetite. Here's a description. Again, the link to this resource is in the description for this video. But they're talking about the Sterling Iron Mine located in Wharton, New Jersey. Talk about mining operations at this particular mine were active from 1640 to 1885. And that operation involved both surface and underground workings. There's various shafts and tunnels. The subsurface depth of the mine reached a maximum depth of 250 feet. So this area of Wharton, you see the dark bands in the northwest corner of the state. And this is an old geologic map where they reference the era of this formation as Azoic, which means before life. They don't use that term anymore because they figured out that algal stromatolites are preserved in the fossil record 
going back 3.7 billion years, so very early in the history of the Earth. So the rocks uh, that are part of this iron formation were deposited around a billion years ago. So I wanted to find out where other sinkholes may have formed or may be forming in this area. So this red square shows the area of the collapse of the roadway on I-80 back in December, 2024. And LIDAR shoots lasers instead of microwave energy. And you can use various platforms to do it. And I'll go over that here in a second. But you have multiple laser points for a given area. And by processing this information and creating a digital terrain model, you're able to essentially subtract out foliage and other vegetation. It also tends to subtract out uh, bridge decks that are suspended over an opening. And we got this map from a USGS site. And it's uh, very interesting. If any of you have detailed questions about how to retrieve these images and download the software in order to work with them from the USGS site, uh, email me at info at ftnc.com and I'll send you back some instructions. You know, this technology has done great things. Um, I've been to Cambodia many times. The first time was back in 1996. And those were some pretty wild and wooly days to be back in Cambodia, given their uh, war-torn history as well as political strife that was going on at the time. But I managed to go to Angkor Wat, which is a originally a Hindu temple complex that was built over a thousand years ago. It was later repurposed as a Buddhist temple. And after the war, there's been various governmental entities and nonprofits that have been in the process of restoring these temples. And as part of that work, they decided, hey, you know, this is real dense jungle foliage in the area, let's, let's see what LIDAR can do. And amazingly, they've got all these detailed features. I mean, there were tens of thousands of people living in this complex over a thousand years ago. And it had extensive system of dikes, irrigation canals, roadways. It was very complex uh, water transfer infrastructure system. And they think that there was a prolonged drought of maybe in excess of 30 years that destroyed the functionality of this infrastructure. And so people dispersed. I mean, this, uh, these temples were jungle ruins with nobody there for many centuries. And so this LIDAR can be collected from airplane, helicopter, drones, or satellite. And uh, there's a, some details on what LIDAR is from NASA, from their remote sensing branch. So going back to that LIDAR image, we see this circular pattern to the northeast. And I wanted to see if it showed up on the Google Earth image, and it does. So this is a water-filled, according to the maps, sinkhole, it looks like to me, that's about 100 feet in diameter. By the way, if any of you know how to toggle Google Earth measuring tool to Imperial units, uh, let me know. It just shows up as metric all the time. Now the distance from this giant sinkhole, this 100 foot diameter sinkhole, is about 300 feet from I-80. And it's about 1,500 feet from this most recent collapse along I-80 that happened back in December. So let's look at this image here. You can see the opening from the sinkhole. And it's, again, very close proximity to this apartment complex and it looks like a above ground parking garage. So very settlement sensitive structure and I would be really concerned about the development of additional sinkholes or enlargement of existing sinkholes. In fact, if you go back to this LIDAR image, you can see these little pockmark zones that, that seem to me to be indicative of previous mining activity. So as I mentioned, there's a mining museum, the Sterling Hill Mining Museum. The subsequent mining was for Franklinite, which is the zinc mineral that's mined to produce zinc. Turns out the city of Wharton was named after Joseph Wharton. He was an industrialist in the 1800s and early 1900s, and he's credited as being the first person to actually successfully smelt zinc ore. And back in the 1800s, early 1900s, they used uh, zinc a lot in roofing, for cheaper material to make sculptures. And then later they started using it for a, a galvanized coating on metal. If you ever seen kind of the dull gray coating on steel, that's, that's typically galvanized uh, using a zinc compound. Now I did a video over a year ago, really early in the history of this channel, where I simulated the formation of a sinkhole 
in this case, I was simulating a sinkhole that developed through solutioning of the bedrock. But the same principle applies. If you've got an underground opening that allows overlying soil and sediment to ravel into those openings, uh, then you'll have sinkhole formation at the ground surface. And I thought this is an interesting map. It shows you the distribution of so-called sinkhole hotspots, whether it's from carbonate, limestone solutioning, evaporite deposits, gypsum and salt that later gets dissolved. You can have openings in volcanic bedrock, lava tubes, that sort of thing. You can actually have melting of ice and permafrost that can form sinkholes. So I think New Jersey DOT got extremely lucky in this situation, but it's a giant red flag, and I suspect that they would be wise to embark on an extensive investigation program, including soil borings, where you could sample various locations throughout this area to delineate the extent of these mines, as well as whether you have parts of it where soil is raveling into the openings of these mines. You can utilize geophysical surveys, seismic refraction or seismic reflection. Seismic reflection is, I think, a little bit better for delineating underground mine openings. But essentially the same equipment, different data acquisition, different data processing. You see refraction surveys in the top panel and reflection surveys in the bottom panel. And here's some advantages and disadvantages. But again, for more accurate delineation of the bedrock conditions, reflection surveys are quite good. Problem with refraction surveys is trying to resolve situations where you have lower velocity material overlain by higher velocity material and you don't have that limitation with reflection surveys. My companies perform seismic refraction surveys. We did a correlation study a few years ago to correlate shear wave velocities with pile capacities. And it's a quite interesting study and it showed very good correlation. So let's just look at what can be done to remediate for these sinkholes. Well, you can backfill them and that's what they did on an emergency basis here in New Jersey. I don't know how selective they were for the backfill material given the emergency nature of it, but generally you wanna have coarser material down low and finer grain material up above. So if the finer grain material moved downwards, it would tend to fill gaps in the larger material. Another thing that can be done is to fill the mine spaces, the tunnels and shafts with what's called flowable fill. So flowable fill is typically a mixture of sand, water, cement, Oftentimes fly ash if a remediation is being done in the Midwest because we have access to really good type C fly ash which has cementitious qualities to it. And also it's a great way to get rid of the fly ash. But uh, with the shuttering of all these coal fire power plants and increasing restrictions on mining in the Powder River Basin of Wyoming, I think uh, fly ash is gonna be harder to come by for these types of projects. I've actually been involved with a number of these. So the idea is you drill holes and you pump this slurry, this uh, flowable fill into the mine opening and work your way up and fill the, essentially the headspace in the mine opening. A lot of these hard rock mines are done with what they call room and pillar methods. So they come in, they extract the rock and they leave some rock in place to act as support columns. A lot of times the extraction ratios are 50%, but it's pretty common that they went back and got more material for these columns to make more money. That's referred to as robbing the pillars. You can also have deterioration of these pillars over time, which can lead to a subsequent collapse of the roof rock and the formation of a sinkhole. In some situations, there's other sinkhole remediation methods available. I was actually on a job in Florida for a power plant that involved all of these methods. So one of them is called deep dynamic compaction. So I'm just gonna run this segment. So they drop a 20 ton weight in this case multiple times, backfill the craters, and then use a smaller weight or a shorter drop height to do what's called an ironing pass. And that's a great way to backfill the opening of a sinkhole. Another thing that can be done is vibro compaction, where you've got a vibratory probe and you backfill the annular space and compact that rock in a bottom-up fashion. You can also have sinkholes formed due to problems with utilities. This was in Japan, and there was some leakage around a water or sewer line that opened up this massive sinkhole. Quite dramatic. But of course, they were able to 
backfill it very quickly in a matter of days. So I'd be interested in what you think about these topics that I've raised here. I think New Jersey really needs to get a handle on the extent of these old abandoned mines that could impact infrastructure and, and buildings and, and other important structures throughout this region. If I was a building owner, and we see a number of large buildings nearby, I've mentioned the apartment complex, there's a Costco, there's a Super Walmart. If I were those people and I was in close proximity to these I-80 sinkholes, I would probably reach out to Value Space and start having them collect INSAR data of the roof to know if there's any signs of potential deflection. So if you can imagine, you know, 40,000 square foot building has columns that go to a footing or a deep foundation element, and then that column supporting the roof, if you start to have a sinkhole develop such that you get columns that settle, you're typically gonna have some indication of that settlement on the roof line. So I think that's a great independent methodology that could be used. So again, if you have questions about implementation of NSAR surveys for either bridges or buildings, uh, reach out to me, info at ftnc.com. With that, I'd like to send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support, as well as those of you who have provided super thanks. That's another great way to support the channel. I've also opened up Buy Me A Coffee and uh, I appreciate those of you who've contributed to that as well. So I've got a lot more great topics coming up, so please stay tuned for future videos.